Hey everybody, welcome to Planet Coaster College. Today I'll be talking about the Schwarzkopf Looping Coaster, also known in-game as the SLV. And I know it's been a while since I made the last episode in this series, but I really want to get back to it for this coaster because, well, partly it was named after me actually by the guys at Frontier, which I can still barely believe. Thanks so much for that, it's amazing. And also, and perhaps not coincidentally, it's one of my favorite coaster types in the world. It's an amazing classic, it's really smooth despite how old these things are and I'll probably get more into details during the rest of this video. And I apologize in advance if I get extra off topic and on a bunch of very long coaster rants. I know that's what this series is all about, but today it might be a little bit more than usual. In any case, I requested this coaster at Sam Danny a little over a year ago in London together with Adfo TV, and I'm pretty sure it's been very often requested from the rest of the community as well. So to see it being here put into the game for the DLC is really amazing. So basically, what's Swatchkopf about? Uh, if you're not too into roller coasters, you might be wondering what the hell I'm talking about and why this is such a big deal. So. Swatchkopf is known generally as one of the pioneers in the entire roller coaster industry. It's, well, really both a person and a company. Really, we're talking about Anton Schwarzkopf, who's pretty much the lead designer and head of the company, but it's his company that built the coasters in the end. Um, and, well, one of his biggest achievements, probably, is the creation of the steel looping coaster. The very first vertical looping in a clothoid shape, I do have to say. I said this statement before and it wasn't actually the first, the first vertical looping. There were wooden coasters and steel coasters before that with a circular vertical looping. But the modern vertical looping with a clothoid shape as we know it today was first used by a Schwarzkopf coaster. Specifically Revolution in Six Flags Magic Mountain, which is also, one of my favorite Schwarzkopfs is an awesome coaster and I really love it. In any case, it's a classic for that very reason. When a lot of people think of a traditional steel looping coaster, this is probably what they are thinking about. It's the standard looping coaster in the Roller Coaster Tycoon games. It's very common in fairgrounds and theme parks around the world. For lots of people, I know this was their first coaster to go upside down, or at the very least, their first coaster to have vertical looping in it. And just overall, these things have been around for so long. The first uh, vertical looping coaster by Schwarzkopf of the Looping Star model, which is pretty much the kind of coaster that we'll be talking about today, was built in 1978. And to this day, these coasters still hold up. They're pretty smooth, they're still really thrilling. And among coaster enthusiasts, they're some of the favorite rides. I should also say that they have a bit of a unique track type. And this is also why this has been so much requested. It's really hard to make these kinds of coasters if you don't have the specific track type. So they have a very distinct look with a round spine in the middle and then almost at the same height, two rails at the sides. And what's interesting is that this type of track was very popular, not just because, well, the guests of the parks wanted it, but because it was very useful for the parks and the families that traveled around fairgrounds putting their coasters there. Because it's a type of track that you can very easily take apart and reassemble. So for that purpose and because of that, it's one of the most common traveling coasters and some of the biggest and best traveling coasters in the world are all Schwarzkopf's. Now, I could name a few examples, I don't want to go on for too long before I actually start building stuff, but definitely the most noteworthy one, I think, is Olympia Looping. It's a traveling coaster with five loopings. It's my personal favorite Schwarzkopf's. Um, it's really intense. It's insanely intense, actually. It has over five Gs at the bottom of those loops because the loops are a little bit more circular than other vertical loops tend to be they get ridiculous high g-forces at the bottom of them and it's a really cool experience and aside from that i think a few other noteworthy ones are revolution in six flags magic mountain there's liseberg banan in liseberg in sweden which was one of the last ones and doesn't actually feature a loop but it's still a really cool track even even be despite that i think um and then there are tons and tons of the looping star model which was a sort of copy-paste of the shelf model 
which traveled a lot across the world and which is probably the most common of this type of coaster. Now, I didn't want to dwell on this for too long, so I suggest that we just start building because there are so many different types of these coasters, but most of them are known as traveling coasters or at the very least are built to be able to travel around. I'm gonna try to build a traveling model here. So it's gonna sit on a very small footprint and I'm gonna try to make it as compact as possible. And at the same time, I'm gonna try to build a bit of a mixture of the existing ones because there are so many different variations. So I'm just gonna try and pick and choose a little bit from all the different ones so you can sort of get the general idea of what these things will look like. So let's get started. So we can find the SLV under the coasters tab, of course, it should sit right over here. And I should also note, it is also a shuttle coaster as it says, but I'm just gonna focus on the general layout in this case. If you want to build a shuttle though, there are tons of amazing shuttles in the world as well. And you can probably find a few good examples of it. My favorite personal is, uh, Psyche Underground in Walibi, Belgium. So that could probably serve as a pretty good example, but usually the shuttle coasters just go back and forth with a loop and then two ends of the track where it goes up and down. So it's not too complicated. So I really want to focus on the more common continuous circuit kind of coaster here. So let's take the station. And I think this is a pretty decent length, although right at the start, I do want to add actually another station square to it. So yeah, we get six cars. That should be pretty good. And I should also say, normally I, I always raise my stations quite a bit from the ground. But in this case, a lot of these coasters are quite close to the ground in their station. So this should pretty much be okay. And you can already see there's a lot of options down here. So I'm going to quickly go over most of them. Here we have the basic track. This is what you see most of the coasters have most of the time. Then there's also the more simple track, which takes away some of those smaller track ties. And I tried for a very long time to find any information about this specifically on the internet. And I really couldn't find anything, but it seems to just be about the stress that's put on the track. So a lot of coasters will sort of switch between the standard track and the alternate track. But most of the coasters, especially the larger ones, have the standard track for most of their layouts. I think a few examples are the, um, I believe it's called the Silver Arrow model, which is a very small model. It's smaller than most Swatch Cops and it only uses the alternate track. And Liseberg Banan in Liseberg is also another coaster that has the one without the extra ties. But in this case, I'm just gonna keep the extra ties throughout the layout since the focus is here really on the layout itself. Then there's also the flat track, which you can use for the less large coasters or break runs or whatever you want to use that for. And then there's the shuttle launch booster, which we won't be concerned with right now. But if you want to use that, it basically goes to this part and then it launches it backwards and then finally forwards again when it comes through the station again. And then I'll just do its shuttle thing. Then there's a wheel lift, which is a lift hill with wheels. And there's also a chain lift. And you can really use both of these. It doesn't really matter too much. I think it kind of depends on what you're going for. A lot of Swatchkopf coasters are are pretty well known for having um, lift hills with curves in them, but it actually doesn't seem to matter whether you have a chain lift or a wheel lift because there are both curved lift hills with chains and curved lift hills with wheels. In this case, I'm gonna go for a wheel one, like on, for instance, the uh, Mindbender in Canada and Olympia Looping. Um, but then there are also drive tires, which you can just use to push the train forward. An interesting note here, I always put a lot of stress on the fact that you should never have coaster sections which are completely straight because a coaster should always be allowed to coast when none of the wheels or brakes are working. But Swatchkopf is a notable exception here. All of the brake runs, etc., are entirely straight. And then we have friction brakes to slow it down and the trim brakes, of course, to slow it down a little bit less and the block sections, which are gonna be important to divide the coaster into multiple trains. So with that said, I would like to try a little bit of a curved lift hill here. And I'm gonna turn on angle snap just because that makes my life a little bit easier and go in about 22.5 degrees upwards. And to build that sort of large lift hill curve, I'm just gonna build a 12 meter piece 
and go up with a 45 degree curve like that. And that should pretty much be a decent curved lift hill. It's pretty big, I do have to say. But then again, I'm going to try to build a pretty big coaster here. So let's bring it down to the top of the lift hill here. And actually, I forgot to do this so far. I should probably add that. Add a little catwalk along the side of the lift hill here. There we go. And then we are pretty much good to go, I would say. I can actually make this a little bit more like that. So I'm going to turn off the catwalk here and start work on the lift hill or actually start work on the rest of the layout. So because this is a transportable coaster, I'm going to try and stay between the lift hill and the station. So what you'll see a lot of Swatchkov coasters do is to really have the brakes and the station and the lift hill on the outside of the layouts and then the entire rest of the layouts, all of the loops and curves and everything kind of fits within that space. So they are extremely compact. And then we're going to turn on a little bit of banking offset. And I should be a bit careful here because banking offset is, or well, hardlining, the different word for it, is a very recent thing. It's very much done by computers nowadays. And these coasters tend to be very much calculated by hand or at the very least not designed with the use of computers like we do nowadays. And they were strictly speaking not hardlined. But what's interesting about a lot of Swatchkopf coasters is that they sort of seem to have a, an intuitive hardline to them because they are somewhat smooth and they almost sort of transition as if there was a hard line, even though there wasn't really any. So I think Swatchkopf probably knew or to some extent understood how to move into curves while making it also a little bit smooth. So I'm just going to have a little bit of banking offsets here. And when we go down for the drop, we don't want to go too steep directly. So usually they kind of slowly transition into their first drop. So I'm going to try and do something similar here. And let's just keep going steeper and steeper. It doesn't matter too much if it's not very smooth. For one, these coasters aren't super smooth to begin with. They have generally smooth layouts, but then the transitions from one track piece to another, because they are so old, isn't always the best. But um, I'm going to smooth it out later much more anyway. So. Don't worry too much about that yet. All right, so now we're going to try and get a bit of a circle going here where it flattens out parallel to the station while also leaving a little bit of space next to the station. What I'm going to try to do is just go down for a curve over here and then come straight back up for a block break section, which is something that you'll see a lot of these kind of coasters do. Right, so as I am coming down here, I want to bank a little bit less. If you have a steep curve coming down like this, you definitely want to get rid of a lot of your banking. All right, there we go. That should be decent. Although I could maybe bank it a little bit more than that. This looks a tiny bit unsafe. All right, let's try that again. And oh, whoops, then we're going to come back up again. And what's interesting is that these kinds of curves, they are very much banked while you're in the drop. And then when you're at the bottom, it's less banked. And then when you're going up again, the steeper it is, the more banked it also often is. And this is all just kind of intuitively trying to minimize the lateral G forces that you feel as a rider. All right, so something like that should more or less do the job. I'm going to try and come back to this place over here without being straight underneath the lift hill. So yeah, I'm just going to see what works here. So what you see with a lot of these coasters is that you've got the lift hill and then there are a lot of brake runs straight on the lift underneath the lift hill. So there might be a brake run here and there might be a brake run here, all horizontal and all almost directly underneath the lift hill because a lot of these will be traveling coasters and they want to have the maximum throughput and capacity as they can. So these are all block sections dividing the coaster into different blocks so you can run a lot of trains on them. So I think Olympia Looping, for instance, can run five trains despite the fact that it's a traveling coaster and despite the fact that it's really so super compact. So having all of these brake runs basically allows the coaster to have 
many different trains on it and be much more efficient. And for a coaster that travels around on fairgrounds and needs to make its money out of selling uh, tickets, that's a pretty important thing. You definitely don't want a line to form there and you want to get as many guests as you can go through it. All right, I think I figured that out. Now it's time to add a block section already over here. Let's try to make that long enough for a, a train to at least decently fit on that. And it's going to remove the supports on the top there, but don't worry too much about that. We're going to need to fix that anyway, because the, a lot of coasters like this, basically they work in a sense that everything is going to be built on the supports of the track parts above it. So you'll have supports coming down here and this track will basically be hanging onto that as well. At least that's what you see with a lot of these coasters. That said, I could probably actually raise this quite a bit more. Let me just see if I can go up a little bit here. And let's start a little bit of a test. So this first part is a little bit of a teaser, I would say, for the rest of the ride. Because it's super short, but still pretty intense. It's definitely really intense with how not so smooth it is over there. Let's actually smooth that out a little bit more. So with this, because we have some delicate banking going on on the sides here, especially over here, I could actually bank that a little bit more even maybe. I would suggest to mess around a little bit with the different kinds of banking that we now have. So try a bit of heights, um, a bit of turn banking, but mostly probably heights banking in our case. And then only at the end to bring it all together, a little bit over of overall smooth all banking. But the problem with smooth all banking with this is that you can get rid of a lot of, um, well, banking basically, which is kind of annoying and we don't want that to happen. So in this case, it's actually not even banked enough anymore down here at the bottom of the curve. So I'm just gonna have to try that again. But it looks all right enough, I suppose. Let's see. So it's coming down over there. Uh, we can always see about that later. I'm actually going to have to look at the g-forces here because as much as I like to get close to 5, I don't really want it to go over 5 here. So let's see about those vertical g-forces because it looks a bit dangerous and... Okay, that's just about right. All right. Yeah, that's pretty good. So you kind of want the, uh, the ride to be painful every now and then. Sometimes these things get way too many vertical g's at the bottom of their drops, but that's more or less what I was looking for. So... Let's keep going. So now I suggest we bring it back down here and start going into some loopings maybe. That'd be nice. So a very general way of looking at Schwarzkopf coasters that I was recommended by Menno. So thank you very much for this, by the way, Menno. That was actually really cool advice. Is to look at it like a circle or, or like a set of three circles. We've got one circle over here. We've got our middle circle sort of following over here and then another circle here. Now the smaller models will typically be two circles, so they're kind of like an eight figure circuit going back and forth. But in our case, since this is a pretty big model, I think we can pretty much make three circles. So after the break run, I'm gonna do some uh, something a little bit sketchy, which you see a lot of these coasters do. So we're gonna go down a little bit and we're gonna go up again. And that should give us enough room. Okay, maybe we're going to do this a little bit quicker. So maybe with six meter pieces like that. But just enough leeway so that we can start making the third circle. And after that's done, we can add some break runs perhaps at the end to see where that, can, that stuff can go. All right, so let's finish it like this and make it come down with a big sweeping curve. And then in the middle somewhere, we can have two loopings. I think that would be nice. All right, so it looks like a pretty decent curve so far. And I'm gonna have to be very careful actually. I'm gonna build the brake run first just to get a bit of a guideline because I want to be as close as possible to the already existing track pieces as I can but at the same time of course I don't want to run into myself here so I'm gonna have to build a little bit more of this here see how much of the way we have to build the loop all right that's that's pretty fair I think we can work with that so these coasters will often come very close to their earlier track sections so I'm not going to be too concerned about that here I just want to make sure that it lines up pretty well and it's just about parallel with the station all right, so we want to start losing that bank over here. Looks pretty good. 
and then maybe already get into a loop here into the other direction there we go Ooh, yeah i think that's pretty decent just gonna have to see how tall we can actually make that definitely not that tall i think actually i need to move a tiny bit inside here but we're generally on the right track i think no pun intended yeah that just about looks parallel to the station track actually that's perfect god wow all right let's keep going then um i'm just not sure about the size of that loop it probably needs to be quite a bit bigger so I'm going to try to bring that down to a little bit lower than the brake section that we just had. And then it should be fine, I think. So what I'm also going to do is I'm going to have a tiny bit of a straight section here in the middle. I know it's not the best looking thing, but I've seen it on a fair amount of these kinds of coasters in real life. Although if I can fit it in without a section like that, that would actually be much better. Hold on a second, let's see if we can do that. And I think that just barely fits. I'm gonna have to make this loop a little bit smaller than the one before that. It shouldn't be too noticeable, but it should stay at the same sort of speed as the first loop. So, something like that. And I always like to look at the skyline of these coasters as well, because they're gonna be at this play. You know, they're gonna be traveling around and you're going to want to see them and you're going to want to have a pretty nice view of the coaster from the front as well. So I think that over there is just about what we're looking for. So I think that's a pretty decent start to the shape of the coaster. We can fill in the rest of the coaster by putting a helix here, a helix here, maybe a bit of a transition here. I don't think there's quite space for a helix and you don't very often see that right in the middle, but it's a pretty good start. And now let's start bringing her back up by curving along with the lift hill with this sort of circle that we're trying to envision in our minds here, if you will, and see if we can fit a little brake run underneath the lift hill here. So I'm gonna be a little bit cheeky here and do something else that you sometimes see on these coasters. Sometimes instead of having the little dip and hill after the brake run, you can also see it before the brake run. So I'm gonna try and do that for a little bit here, just to dive underneath this section which we have earlier and I'm gonna have to check whether the clearance on that is actually good enough. But if it is, that's pretty good because these things are always so compact and tightly woven. All right, so let's see. Oh yes, that is definitely good enough. Close enough where you can see the track being way too close than at least closer than it normally is on a coaster, but I think it's still good. So let's go for that. Now that's fine and dandy, but so far we've only been taking right turns, so I think it's right about time to start moving into a different direction. So what usually works, but now I have to kind of check that again because it's getting a little bit tight here, so maybe I'm gonna have to shorten this brake section a little bit. But what usually works and what you see a lot of these coasters do is to kind of crisscross from side to side. So in this case, it's probably a good idea to dive straight down here and then make a turn to the left at the bottom of this. And if you think there's not enough space for that, if you think it's a little bit too tight, that's exactly what we're looking for. Usually I find myself thinking for a split second when I write these things in real life. You know, when you look down at the curve that you're going down into, it just feels like there's not enough space. It just feels like it's way too tight and it's just gonna be painful. And usually it is maybe a little bit painful and a little bit weird, but Really, that's what these coasters are all about. So let's get into a very tight turn over here and see if we can make anything out of it. All right, so that's pretty steep, actually. But let's try it anyway. Hopefully, that'll be good. And start banking a little bit during this transition. So this is going to have to be pretty heavily banked as well. I kind of want to pause it for a second here, see if we can actually get g-forces which a human can survive down here because it might get a little bit too dangerous actually i kind of feel like torturing the guests you know what i think it's probably fun to really build this into an actual helix yeah let's just go for that let's just build a helix it's gonna be pretty intense but if it works then it's gonna be great and as you start going up you also want the banking to pull out a little bit all right, that's a little bit crazy. So actually, let's see if it takes it all right. So far, we're still all good, but this might be 
a tiny bit dangerous. Well, and all the G-forces are actually mostly fine. So yeah, let's just keep it in. Now let's keep following the sort of circular shape that we've established earlier. So that doesn't mean we need to form a perfect circle here, but we do want to make a turn to the right somewhere in the middle of this. So I think at this point, it's a good idea to have a, a section which goes kind of straight-ish, sort of like this, and then have a transition in there to a piece which is going to the right. Actually, I would probably divide it into two pieces just to make smoothing a little bit easier. So something like this should work. And also don't be afraid to kind of overbank that a little bit. But since we're following the general curve sort of layout of the track, I think we're on a pretty good layout here. Yeah, something like that. And we'll start to unbank it a little bit here and then get into another one of these transition pieces. Now these transitions are usually the parts where these coasters get a little bit rough in real life since the transition of going from a banked curved piece to a straight and opposite banked piece is always a little bit hard. So if that's a little bit rough, I would say it's pretty much just how it's supposed to be. And as we come down lower, we can decrease the incline a little bit and get into a very tight, narrow helix down here. Actually, I could make that maybe even a little bit tighter because it's already slowing down quite a bit. And this is probably partly due to the block brakes. So I'm actually going to get back to that and set them to a slightly higher speed as well. That would probably be good. But still, we can have the coaster go a little bit faster than this, honestly. All right, awesome. And if all goes well, we will be... Ooh, that's actually really tight. Hold up. Um, I'm going to have to bring that maybe a little bit lower. Expand that piece a bit over here. And then we'll go out, sort of leave the curve already during the helix. So that you have a little bit more space to transition out of it. And then if we cross to the other side here, we'll be more or less following the sort of circular shape that we have there, so that's perfect. All right, now we're getting toward the end of the track, and I do want to make sure that all of this is parallel and completely straight. So I'm gonna start working from the end again and just have this curve around. Actually, that can be a little bit closer to the already existing track. Maybe something like that will probably work, yep. And then we really are perfectly underneath the lift hill, or actually the second drop over here. So that's pretty much exactly what I'm looking for. Let's just have some trim brakes maybe over here to bring it down to a decent speed. Actually, just friction brakes, uh, friction brakes will probably do because I'm going to have to decrease the speed by quite a bit. And then we'll maybe have some trim brakes on a bit of a slope to transition into this part. All right, now I didn't smooth anything out besides the first drop yet. So let's take this whole curve, smooth that out a little bit. I don't want to quite grab this yet because I don't want to pull it along with the curve, but this should be good enough. Smooth that out. Actually increase the bank on that a little bit as well. All right, that looks pretty good. And let's do the same for this side. Let's actually increase the banking a little bit more because smoothing will always get rid of some of your banking. So you always have to adjust this while you're doing the smoothing. So something to also note about smoothing is that it will always make all of your helixes a little bit smaller. So it's gonna increase the g-forces on this a tiny bit as well. Just something to keep in mind. And then for this, because I want all of these transitions to be a little bit smoother, I think I'm just going to grab all of this at the same time, smooth out the heights, smooth out the turn a little bit, and then we'll do a smooth R quickly, but not too much. And that's already the final part. Now I'm going to fine tune this a little bit. So this is definitely not going to be all the smoothing, but at some point, all you want to do is just go back to all the different pieces, try a POV, see what it looks like, and just hit some extra smooth on the sections which didn't quite look right, or maybe even redo them a little bit. But then again, for this kind of coaster, I'm not really too concerned about it. All right, so I could probably get it to be a little bit smoother than it is right now, but I think we're at a decent level. And I also don't want to sacrifice too much of the shaping 
in terms of the smoothing. Because very often, the smoother you make your coaster, the, the more you lose of the signature shaping. And in this case, I do want to keep those very snappy transitions from the heavily banked sections over here into the straight over here, or this kind of quick transition into the very steep helix. So we have the first drop over there, which has some high Gs, but nothing too bad, I think. And then transitioning into the part with the two loopings here, and we again get some pretty high forces, but nothing very high. And typical about these sort of circular loops is that you get very high forces here, but less forces at the top of the loop. So you really sort of feel as though you're going through a circle, which is something that I personally really like. The loops are definitely my favorite parts of these kinds of rides. And then some really strong helix is actually ridiculously strong over here. I'm going to have to maybe make that helix a bit bigger because that did get smaller with smoothing. Uh, and this one is more or less fine. This is actually more of what you're looking for. Maybe a long sustained 3 to 3.5 Gs. I think something like that is pretty reasonable. This one hits 5G at some point, so I might need to make that a little bit bigger again. It can definitely expand a bit into over here. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be improved on this ride, but the general idea still stands, I think. It's a rectangular compact layout with a set of almost three circles that it's kind of rotating around. We've got the almost circular loops in the front here and some transition sort of back and forth zigzagging to make sure that we don't take the curve in the same direction every single time. And then there's just some other stuff to play around with, like these straight sections that sort of transition from a curve into another because these coasters couldn't really smoothly blend from one curve into another like the uh, modern computer generated coasters can. Some very tight helixes with high Gs, maybe not as high as this one, but generally that's something that you're looking for as well. And then a layout with very much the lift hill at the back of it. You know, this would be sort of where you'd be looking at the coaster from. And then a bunch of brake runs sort of underneath that. And if you were to get into more of the scenery aspect of it, a support structure which supports the lift hill, but then also has the brake runs underneath it, basically attached to the same supports as well. So yeah, overall, I am pretty happy with the layout. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty decent idea, I would say, of what a Swatchkopf coaster, at least the traveling models, are like. So I'm gonna take some time for myself here to theme this thing, but I think it'd be interesting to time-lapse that. So I haven't really done this much before, but I'm gonna give this thing a bit of a makeover, a bit of a different color scheme, and then some supports, and perhaps a small station, and then we'll see what it looks like in the end. Now, I want to give you guys a heads up. I will be spending the next 15 minutes building supports for this coaster. And I would also like to add, this is also excluding some of the footage which I didn't end up recording, as well as some of the research that I did to try and figure out how to build supports. So after all, this is a very time consuming process. And I'd like to warn you guys that you don't have to do this when you build a Schwarzkopf coaster. You really don't have to force this onto yourself. A lot of these coasters weren't really transportable anyway, so in that case you can pretty much just keep the in-game supports. But in this case, because I wanted to make this as if it were a transportable Schwarzkopf coaster, and I wanted to see what the support structures would be like, I decided to look a little bit into it and try to recreate, at least to the extent that I could, and that I could within this one video, and also that I could with some of the resources that I had on the internet trying to find out how these supports work, I tried to, well, recreate the Swatchkopf support structure as much as possible. And I want to give a huge shout out here also to King RCT3, as he is known on YouTube at the very least, who's been a dear friend of mine for a long time and I decided to send him a message yesterday just complaining about the fact that I could barely find anything on the internet in terms of resources about Schwarzkopf coasters and he ended up going on a bit of a researching spree along with me as well and apparently the Olympia looping coaster was the favorite coaster to support according to Anton Schwarzkopf himself so that in the end I decided would be the best coaster to look into and to try and base these supports on. 
And what you really find is that the supports overall kind of follow the shape of the coaster itself. Remember how I talked about the structure of having three circles almost within the rectangular layout of the coaster? So what you see if you look at a picture of Olympia looping uh, from an aerial perspective is that you've got these supports on the ground that connect all of the supports and they also extend from the middle of these circles almost in a sort of radius exactly following the different curves which makes a lot of sense because all of the curves they all sort of rotate around this single center point so all of the supports kind of just come out from this area as well but in, in essence it means that you're trying to build two support systems at a time and you always have to keep these sort of in sync so at once I'm building these white supports to support the coaster make sure that it's not actually floating in mid-air but I'm also using the blue supports which have to connect all of these different supports and a support can't just go into the ground it always have to it has to connect to these blue beams and preferably you want to have as many parts of the track connect to the same support as you can so over here for instance at the lift hill this was pretty easy to do because I made sure to put the brake runs straight underneath the lift hill so all I had to do is try and figure out where I could place the beams in such a sense that they could connect the different tracks while also not running into the cars itself. There should always be enough clearance so that the car or, you know, that you're not decapitating people or something like that. So that was easy enough. Um, but then there are also parts where, especially around the curves and the different transitions, the supports get a little bit more wonky and probably also a little bit less realistic. There wasn't so much of a reference in terms of real life coasters of what I should base that on. But after all, I think that's what made this into a slightly more difficult process than just supporting a regular coaster. But even then, it's it was still something fun to try and I think it was definitely worthwhile to try a support structure like this. What was also interesting, by the way, King RCT3 also found some patterns of Swatchkopf just trying to find out about the track ties because I originally sent him a message asking about the track ties. So this is something that I mentioned at the start of the video. If you compare the first track type and the second track type in Planet Coaster, the first one is the regular, the original one, which has these little tiny beams between the rails just above the spine. And the second one is the same, but without these tiny beams. And I could never find out what these little beams were for. They really seemed to be for extra support. And this is also what Planet Coaster says. So uh, King RCT3 started looking around, couldn't find anything on the patents of the track type. So the, the sort of cone plug, as they call it, track type, which is so easy to dismantle and put together. So couldn't find anything about that, but according to his friend who's an industrial designer, apparently the tiny ties are for employee purposes, being able to climb onto the track and to act as a sort of ladder, which makes sense, I think, actually. If you look at it, they're sort of placed at an interval, which definitely makes it much easier for people to, ha to hang on to that. So perhaps, but you know, this is all just as sort of a, a, an anecdotal evidence and not really a super trustworthy source, I suppose. But perhaps it seems like these extra track ties weren't for support, but really for maintenance reasons, for allowing staff to climb onto the track uh, and go wherever they needed to go in whatever kind of emergency, which is really interesting. And I think in the end, it's not something to worry about too much, really. But I thought it was worth looking into. And thanks also to King RCT3 for looking into this for me because it's been on my mind for quite a while now. I've been working on this video for a few days and it's something which you just don't really find on the internet. Speaking of finding stuff on the internet, I also really need to thank a certain website which has a lot of different kinds of information about Schwarzkopf. It's swatchkopfcoaster.net with between Schwarzkopf and Coaster there's a hyphen and it has all kinds of different tabs about the history and about the different track types and about the, the coasters 
And it's overall, I think, the best place to find information about this really interesting company on the internet. Um, it is a bit of a slightly old website though, I think. And like everything, it's not that well sourced. It's not a very academic reference, I suppose. But it's, it's really interesting to read through everything and it's where I got most of my knowledge from before I started working on this video and when I was doing some basic research to look into the company a little bit more. So yeah, there's all that. In the meantime, I've got a lot more support work done. In the end, this actually turned out to be quite fun. The way that I ended up going about it was to just create a very general idea of where I wanted all of the different supports to be by laying out that network of the blue-ish beams at the bottom and then just trying to fit all the white ones on that. And what I found actually becomes really easy due to doing it like this is that normally for a coaster you kind of have to work out where you want to place the supports to actually place enough supports and it's always a bit of a struggle to kind of make that match up but in this case it's kind of just like you pick a blue beam and then you see what part of the track goes above that and what other parts of the track are close to that and then you just build off of that so every time it's just picking a blue beam building a support there and supporting all of the track which is anywhere around that area which is um a kind of a fun way of doing it it gives you a bit more of a guideline of where you want to build so i thought that was quite interesting i should also note the game gives me some footers for the loop supports and i'm gonna keep these in unfortunately if i were to be completely realistic I would have to build a, a kind of casing to place these big funky loop supports in because these are quite big and heavy and you can tell on the transportable uh, support structure. But in the game's case, you automatically get some footers and I don't want to remove those either because the in-game loop supports are absolutely perfect and I wouldn't be able to build anything better myself. But it just means that the loop supports are going to look as though they were uh, permanent instead of transportable, which shouldn't be too much of a nuisance, I guess, but it's it, it detracts a little bit from the realism of the support work of the coaster, I suppose. In any case, I so far I was just working on the lift hill structure and everything that's kind of close to that, so that was pretty easy. But in this case, I had to do it a little bit differently. I'm working on the different transitions, and like I said, this was a little bit harder than doing the lift hill. So what I ended up doing is picking those sort of vertical beams or rather the horizontal beams that cut across the layouts and placing supports along those. And after that, taking away the beams and connecting the different supports together to try and get as few footers as I could in the uh, general layout of the support network. And still, I'm not entirely sure how realistic this is but this is largely based on olympia looping and what the supports for olympia looping look like so overall i think i'm pretty happy with it but i do have to say i got a lot more respect than i already had because i i already respected these things a lot but my respect has gone up so much just by trying to do this for all of these different transportable coasters because building a coaster that can actually travel around and be built and dismantled at any given time that's insanely difficult the amount of engineering that goes into this and the amount of thoughts that had to be put into all of the different supports like everything in this thing works together the the placement of the track the way that the layout sort of falls in and out of itself the way that all the supports work together everything was created in in sort of uh, well, working together, because not only did the layout have to be fun, it also had to be easy to create and dismantle, it had to fit with the support structure, so it's a really impressive work of engineering, I think. So yeah, hats off to whoever built this coaster together with Swatchkopf, and also to the people who are still traveling this coaster around, because for how old... Uh, well, I'm saying this coaster, really I had Olympia looping in mind, for how old that thing is, it's still amazing how well it holds up and it's going to be a sad day when they finally decide to not let it, let it travel around anymore and when nobody wants it. In any case, we're 
Getting near the end of the time lapse here, I'm just finishing up the coaster a little bit with some flags and other decorations and trying to build a very simple park around it, but that's not really the focus here. My goal here is to basically look at, make it look presentable for the uh, intro of the video. So at this point, my work is pretty much done. Let's go back for a final real time session and look at the coaster go around and then I'll call it a day. I think for the tutorial part of this video, we're pretty much done. All right, so here we are. This is pretty much the coaster as you saw it in the intro as well. And it's more or less finished. I could have obviously done a lot more when it comes to the scenery around it, but hey, that's just for Planet Coaster College here. In any case, I'm pretty happy with the layout. One thing that I should probably have said somewhere during the rest of my video, but that I still want to bring up in the end is that as much as these coasters are very typical ver or very typically a design of Schwarzkopf, they are closely linked to Werner Stengel as well, who is um, a someone who's been extremely influential in the roller coaster industry. And I couldn't even begin to describe how much this man has influenced the the entire way in which roller coasters are being made. For one, he more or less pioneered the idea of heartlining and worked very closely together with Swatchkopf. So a lot of the, especially early Swatchkopf coasters, are so typically Swatchkopf not just because of the company itself, but also because of Werner Stengel's involvement in engineering and calculating these rides. And doing all of that sort of hard science stuff that I don't know a lot about. In any case, that's just about it for this episode. So I hope you guys somehow managed to stay awake during this entire run. I know that I'm definitely almost falling asleep right now. But um, yes, thank you so much to Frontier for giving this coaster to the game as well. And for naming it after me, which is absolutely amazing. I hope you guys learned something from this huge video, or that it was at least entertainable in some way. And I'm gonna get back into some regularly scheduled videos, although maybe I do want to bring back Planet Coaster College a little bit more, aside from just this video as well. We'll see. In any case, thanks for watching, bye bye.